Hey, how's everybody doing? Hope you're having a fantastic day. So today what I wanted to do is I wanted to continue to go through that first chapter uh, on uh, condign marriage uh, from Bishop Davenant. wanted to finish it uh, in this last section. It's not as bad um, as the first section. The first section, uh, as we saw, was just, you know, <laughs> anxiety inducing. But this section... Um, the reason it's not that bad is because this is really, um, kind of a difficult question of how exactly we're parsing out the schools. Um, unfortunately, Davenant seems to take the worst possible interpretation of, <laughs> of what each one of these schools means. And what we're going to see actually is unfortunately, um, and this is to be expected a bit, but uh, in another way, it's not really a, a good excuse. But Davenant uh, really is cherry picking. Uh, what I mean by that is he's cherry picking uh, a lot of these positions from contemporary um, manuals to him, really, uh, contemporary commentaries on the Summa. So you, you, when you read him you, and you read, uh, for example, Bellarmine. Um, actually, the three the three really are Vasquez, Bellarmine, and Suarez. Uh, three Jesuits, uh, by the way. Um, uh, when you read ba Vasquez, uh, Suarez, Bellarmine, you read the respective sections, especially the one he, ones he quotes. They give almost word for word the exact same definitions, the exact same quotes, the exact, exact same um, uh, references. So it's it's really clear that uh, a lot of people get confused about this and they'll read something like Davenant's work or uh, other uh, Protestant authors of the day. And they'll say like, oh, wow, they're uh, reading all of these medieval authors. They have access to all of these works. They're really good medievalists. And they're really reading all of these primary sources and trying to figure out what they mean and blah, 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 blah. Um, but this just isn't the case. And this comes through, uh, especially my beloved uh, Dominican school, uh, the the way in which he interprets um, them. And it comes through to just show that he doesn't really understand uh, what the positions being set out are. Um, so from there, I think I will uh, start the section um, because there's really two sections. The first one is how they define condign merit. And the sec second one are the positions on the grounds of condign merit. So when it comes to the way in which he uh, represented that we affirm condign merit, the definitions we use for condign merit, I actually didn't find that to be, um, oops, let me drop my pen. Yeah, I don't even know why I have a pen. But I didn't find that, that part to be too reprehensible. Um, but the issue was, is the issue is that basically every single one of these authors, they're going to provide a general philosophical definition of condign merit, its grounds, um, it, its, uh, its definition, its uh, relations, um, and are, are going to provide this initial definition of condign merit. But as they go through the disputation, they're going to show that uh, really it's an analogous term. So we need to uh, provide some greater distinctions, as I did in the first half, like equality, uh, the difference between a geometric and ar arithmetic uh, equality, or uh, an equality of quantity and proportion, uh, which is basically the same thing. Um, or you can look at the debt of justice, the different ways in which we speak the debt of justice, or we can look at distributive versus commutative justice, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's important, and these authors are going to make this distinction. I checked out specifically Vasquez. Um, but I also quickly checked out uh, Kajetan as well because I have pretty good access to Kajetan. Um, and just read through like some of these some of these sections and you see these quotes where they're making these distinctions and just throwing out, okay, this is their definition and then saying like, oh, how silly it is to, to apply this to this question. It just misses the point, misses the point completely. So uh, let's begin and I'm beginning on page 71 right now. Let us proceed then to consider the arguments of our opponents, who in establishing this merit of con dignity are just as much at variance among themselves as they differ from us. And for, to the first point, this just isn't true, um, that we differ amongst ourselves as much as, much as um, we differ from the Reformed. Um, this, isn't, this isn't true at all. Uh, 
the uh, when you read Bellarmine, this the section from Bellarmine he quotes, it's kind of funny because he's basically like uh, stealing from Bellarmine <laughs> a lot of the uh, a lot of the citations for what the medievals believed. But then Bellarmine has a section of like, okay, how does Scotus's uh, doctrine of merit differ from the doctrine of merit of the Lutherans? Doesn't doesn't mention that at all. But uh, to to be fair, I do think that Davenant, um, if he had a lot of these principles clarified to him, I do think Davenant actually would broadly be able to uh, hold something like a Scotus uh, Scotus position on these points. So uh, continuing, and in the first place, we must inquire what is to be understood by merit of condignity. And in this, this is where we get into trouble because he's going to be uh, defining it in its plain sense, in its simple sense, without uh, the way in which it's applied to God. Thus, then, Bonaventure says, merit then acquires valet ex condigno, ex condigno, condigno. Now, why is it the nya? You know, that's ecclesiastical Latin for you. You know, we, we have this weird, um, yeah, I guess it would be in condign. I guess so the, the Europeans would. Uh, no, you know, I'm not I'm not going to worry about this right now, but there's this weird sort of thing we do with uh, when we pronounce English words that are Latin derived, where we have like this traditional English Latin pronunciation. And I just I just absolutely hate it because when I switch between words, I know I just mess up the pronunciation. OK, so when the proper character of <laughs> there, I'm, when the proper character of merit is found there fully and perfectly so that the work is in some degree commensurate and adequate to the reward, nor does Durandus differ from him, who thus describes the merit of condignity. Uh, it is an action by which there accrues to him who performs it something due from the quality of the work. That is, on the ground of an equality between the work and the reward, according to a just estimate. And again, merit arising from condignity, strictly and properly taken, is a voluntary act on account of which an individual can claim a reward on the score of justice, so that if recompense is not made, he whose business it is uh, to make it acts unjustly and withholding it. And it's uh, it's very important that a lot of these authors, um, oddly enough, will we'll just... Uh, We'll say that this is a completely different case with God. Is God would not be acting unjustly uh, if He did not uh, give this recompense or that recompense. Okay, but continuing with this, Cajetan co coincides, who lays it down that merit of condignity appertains to that which is absolutely just. And this, of course, I, I had to go back and uh, and check and check Cajetan uh, on this. Of course, um, let me see. I'm trying to find my note. Oh, there it is. So, um, Cajetan, of course, understands St. Thomas, and he distinguishes between two types of condign merit in St. Thomas. So he's just explicitly in this section doing that. Um, so, so he, and then this is what he says. So it is said that the reward would be unjustly withheld at the due time from one who operated from grace. And God, who is a debtor to himself, who ordained, does not by superadded ordination, as Scotus thought, but by the grace itself make his act meritorious from this alone, that it is from grace, which is of such a nature, just as it cannot act against itself. So it cannot withhold the reward with which, however, it stands that he can also annihilate all the blessed from absolute power. But this is outside the present question. So he's saying, of course, by the absolute power of God, that uh, he can withhold the reward. And uh, the cases are brought up, uh, for example, as I mentioned, um, the acts done from charity and purgatory, where this happens. But but uh, Cajetan, of course, distinguishes um, between the two senses of condign. And he uh, he does this at the end of uh, his commentary on question 114, article 3. I think it's uh, number 6 that he does this. That is to uh, that justice, properly so called, in which there is an equality between the thing given and the thing received. If our opponents shall be able to prove that there is such a commensurateness or equality between the works of the regenerate and the kingdom of heaven, we shall readily admit the merit rising from condignity. Okay, well, that's the gold avenant <laughs> for us to for us to prove this. But all of these other authors that you're quoting um, have kind of already done it. Okay, so now, um, uh, okay, so now uh, in this next paragraph. He goes in from the ancient authors, so apparently Cajetan's an ancient author, which I thought to be interesting, uh, to the more modern authors, which he quotes uh, Suarez and Vasquez. And I wanted to focus in on, on Vasquez, um, because Vasquez, this is, this is what he quotes from Vasquez, uh, that between the merit of condignity and the reward claim, there's an equality of worthiness, 
between the merit of congruity and the recompense made, there's not this equality, but the recompense is greater than the actual worthiness of the, that meritorious work. So he, he per, actually, Vasquez very frequently uh, provides these distinctions. I, I grabbed a few quotes. Um, so this first one, he says, furthermore, it must be observed that when we say some work is congruously meritorious because it is imp impetratory and therefore said to merit or reward, it should be understood in such a way that God does not recompense. It causes nothing indecent or incongruent, just as even if God did not reward condign merits, he would do nothing unseemly or unworthy of his majesty. For since he is bound to no one as debtor except through his word, it follows that it would n neither unseemly nor incongruent if he gave nothing for a congruous or even condign merits. So when you read the whole of Vasquez, he's clearly making these distinctions. He's interpreting condign merit in such a way as God's not a debtor. He's doing it as if he could withhold um, the reward by his power. So he's making these distinctions. And then um, I found a few other places as well. And I thought also thought it was funny because obviously um, in this uh, in his Prima Secunde question 114, Article 5, Disputation 218, Chapter 4, um, in this section, um, I was reading through some of the uh, some of the chapters in, uh, I think, Disputation 113 and 118. It was interesting because he's he's providing very intelligent, very lengthy uh, arguments from the church fathers and from some of the language they use when describing merit and such. So uh, Bellarmine's previous critique where, I mean, not Bellarmine, uh, Davidin's previous critique where he's like, oh, Bellarmine and none of the papists ever bring up the fathers. And then he brings up like six fathers. Like that's just stupid when you're reading, uh, when you're uh, start to read these guys and realize, well, actually, you know, they, they weren't just uh, not at all caring about whatever the father said or any anything like that. They were actually very intelligent um, interpreters of the fathers. Um, so I, I found two more quotes uh, that kind of push this through for Vasquez. Therefore, let us conclude from what has been said that the true nature of merit simply lies in it being a work worthy of praise and glory or of punishment and disgrace, according to the equality of condignity. For it is to be in the matter of justice, with the obligation of it not at all required, as we noted, since between us and God there is no justice properly so called, but only in a broader sense. So notice this is very important. Is the obligation, i.e. debt, is being interpreted differently. The justice is being interpreted in two senses. So there's distinctions being made once the general definition is, is set out, because, again, it's an analogous notion. And he continues, whether besides the dignity of merits, the obligation, at least the fidelity from a promise is required, we will discuss in the following disputation. So notice, fidelity from a promise, which is in much of the same way of... Um, how Davenin himself described his own view. And in another place, when he requires for the nature of merit simply an equality according to justice, so he's talking about Aquinas, he understands equality between merit and reward according to condignity, in which is considered a certain notion of justice broadly. So notice there's different notions of justice, which we're speaking not strictly, but broadly, or commonly, not strictly and properly said. And this suffices for the notion of condign merit even if there is no debt of justice properly. So notice, these guys know about these distinctions, and they're making these distinctions. So just quoting what they uh, happen to say about the general notion of merit of condignity is just completely useless for, uh, for our, you know, for our uh, uh, purpose here. And um, then, he, then he continues, and he just like absolutely you know, obliterates it. Uh, uh, you perceive what merit of condignity the Jesuits are desirous to establish, a merit sufficient to claim the reward of eternal glory, equal or commensurate, binding God from a debt of justice, or at least from a debt of gratitude to pay this reward of eternal life to those who perform such services. So far, then, they accord well enough in ascribing a merit of condignity to good works. But when they are urged to explain whence this condignity arises, uh, Grievous are their internal squabbles about it, nor is there any fixed point in which they can agree. This is like, it's completely ridiculous. Um, uh, we'll, we'll see when, when we uh, start explaining this. Because basically what he's saying is he's like, oh, they all agree exactly on what condignity means, which kind of isn't true. Uh, they, they all agree on what, what it means, but they can't even find out what the grounds of condignity is. They don't even know. They have no idea. And really, he, he d distinguishes between four opinions, which brought four opinions 
<laughs> that's not like that's not crazy. I mean, yeah, we have theological opinions. Um, Reformed schools have theological opinions. Um, this isn't this isn't crazy to have four different opinions. I mean, really, one of the opinions that he states is basically the same as another opinion. So I mean, it's kind of just three opinions. And then I personally, I think one of the opinion basically has no adher adherence. So really, it's like two opinions. I mean, uh, when, when you look in later manuals, like 19th, 20th century ones, uh, you can read like the Sacred Theologia Summa, uh, for example. They're going to say, OK, there's two opinions. And really, the, the opinion is whether uh, merit has condignity in actu primo, uh, merely supposing divine ordination, divine uh, or or if it uh, flows in actu secundo uh, from uh, divine ordination as no um, no existence in actu primo, um, which. Uh, it's it's a really it's a really subtle uh, subtle dispute. It's a very subtle dispute, um, and really, I've, I've never met a Protestant who's been able to explain to me the the subtlety of that dispute. It's very difficult, um, but it's like there, there's not really uh, that much difference uh, at all, not at all. Um, Bellarmine lists three opinions, uh, I think, um, and I think he's right in listing these three opinions. I think he's wrong in some of who he includes in the third, and I think the third really nobody. Ex uh, there might be like one or two who exist that take this position, but um, not that many at all. Okay, but anyways, uh, yeah, and then Davenant reads reads these secondary sources. He doesn't really um, get into all of these different authors. At least, I, I can't say definitively that he doesn't, uh, but at least it doesn't seem to me um, that he doesn't. And at least he gives no indication that he does. And it seems like actually with uh, some of the footnotes and comments and the almost identical language that are used in both of these, it's almost certain that he was uh, just taking from Suarez, Vasquez, or Bellamine. Okay, so uh, uh, for the patrons themselves, even the most strenuous uh, of the merit of condignity are not settled whether this condignity arises, whether whence this condignity arises. And he says, the groundlessness of the notion is, however, discernible, hence that any of them, with scarcely any difficulty, overthrows the opinion of the other, though not, not one solidly establishes his own. Like, what, what is this supposed to mean? He's like, oh, yeah, they just argue uh, with each other and they don't actually, like, uh, prove their own opinion. Come on. I mean, this is just this is just ridiculous for anybody who's who's read the literature. Um, it, it really is just ridiculous because, I mean, they're they, they quote uh, like, for example, Vasquez, um, if I'm remembering correctly, usually has three arguments uh, in support of every thesis. <laughs> Uh, obviously magisterial, uh, scriptural, um, and from the fathers. He also sometimes has them from reason. I mean, he's he's giving a lot of positive uh, proofs uh, for his positions. Um, Suarez is the the king of like lengthy uh, patristic catena, um, and Bellarmine as well is is known for his lengthy patristic catena. Um, but it's it's kind of just crazy to uh, to say this that you know. They just, uh, they just don't, nobody solidly establishes his own. What Vasquez has raised up, Suarez throws down. What Suarez has built up, Vasquez overturns. And what's kind of funny here is that, <laughs> um, doesn't, uh, I think, I think, um, right below Davenant says that they hold the same. Oh, no, no, no. Um, they hold very slightly distinct, uh, the second and third opinions, very slightly distinct. Um, nobody, uh, I guarantee nobody can tell me what the actual difference between these two opinions are. Um, I don't think they're different. I think they're basically the same thing. Um, but yeah, they, they're throwing each other down. They're disagreeing. They're killing each other. You know, it's just like ridiculous rhetoric. Um, I, I despise this rhetoric. Okay, so the first, okay, the first opinion, and this is the, this is an actual, actual opinion. Um, so I think he's perfectly right about uh, this first one. Although a lot will identify this with the Lutheran opinion, although every, basically every single one of these supporters of them had sections where they said, okay, this is how we differ from the Lutherans. But the first, that good works possesses a worthiness and principle of merit for receiving life eternal, but that this merit is derived, so that this uh, where it's important, derived from the ordination or accept, acceptance of God, not to any intrinsic value in the works themselves. This is the opinion of Scotus, the nominalists, and along with more modern of Andreas uh, Vegas. Uh, with all these, merit is regarded as a title without anything itself, and they admit a merit merely on the style of speaking, not in reality. Really, this this position more so um, 
has to do with SCOTUS and the nominalists' uh, views of divine acceptation in general, uh, their their view of the will of God in general. Um, so they're gonna they're gonna hold that uh, the reason that there needs to be this acceptance um, is because in order to have this uh, have this reward in general. Um, any sort of reward in general, uh, there, there needs to be this acceptation, uh, which is antecedent to it. So, so that's important. Um, that's important to, to put in general. I mean, this is going to be, uh, his, his view of the supernatural order as well. The supernatural order for, for, uh, SCOTUS is something which is dependent on the will of God. Um, so, so that's, that's where the foundation comes from. This really isn't a difference in our view on merit itself. It's really antecedent to that. It's really a difference in our view of the way in which justice relates to God, the way in which uh, God's will uh, relates to the world. Um, well, the world relates to God's will, because there's no real relation between God's will and the world. So that's that's important. Uh, but yeah, this position is that there is no condignity of merit in acto primo, but only in acto secundo, uh, which flows from positively this is important. It flows from positively the will of God. And then these next two opinions uh, are basically the opinions, I think, of every uh, everyone else. I think is the opinion of St. Thomas, is the opinion of um, the majority uh, of the scholastics. And so the second one is that the principle of the merit of condignity consists in two things, namely the, the intrinsic worthiness of the work and the super added promise of God. This is this is actually uh, kind of wrong to call it a super added promise of God. And I'll explain in a second. So that the work as performed by the agent has a sufficient proportion and value uh, in regard to the reward, yet requires the promise of God to superinduce the obligation on the score of justice from which the reward becomes due to it. And then the third opinion, which is basically the same as the second. Third opinion is that there are uh, those who say that our works are meritorious from the intrinsic value which they derive from grace, from the promise of God, and from the merits of Christ wherewith they are, as it were, adorned and sprinkled. Gregory of Valencia seems to embrace this opinion. And to this, the title saying of the Romans, the, uh, the tr that trite saying of the Romanists has reference, that our works, as far as they are sprinkled with the blood of Christ, are deserving of life eternal, in which opinion Tapper, uh, Lindenus, uh, Hosius uh, uh, coincided with others whose names are recited by Vasquez. So notice... Um, Oh, yeah. Yeah. So he doesn't say that Vasquez holds the third one. Vasquez actually holds the second one. Um, <laughs> OK, yeah. Vasquez holds the second one. And he's saying as his example that Vasquez uh, and Suarez were like killing each other. Okay, yeah. OK. Um, yeah. But he does. He he just got his list of these this third opinion from Vasquez. But the second and third are basically the same. Uh, it's not it's not exactly accurate to call this a super added promise of God, because that was the whole critique of these authors against SCOTUS is um, basically what they thought SCOTUS was doing. And um, I don't know if they're right about this, actually. I still have to think through this. SCOTUS's texts on this topic are quite obscure. Um, but what they claimed, at least, that, that SCOTUS was doing is that SCOTUS himself uh, multiplied uh, promises. Because for the, for the Thomist, um, and then this is generally for the others as well, with their distinction between the order of intention and order of execution, they would basically say like, oh, the, the covenant and promise of God and the grace grace of God are basically like one and the same thing. Is God God has intended um, to, to work in that person, to bring them to eternal life, and he does this by giving them grace. So it's one and the same thing. There, there isn't this sort of twofold, two block. Uh, theory. The two block theory of, of a sort of super added promise um, was something which was said that SCOTUS held to. So uh, it, it's very clear that Davenant is being imprecise um, here for sure. And that's the actually almost exactly uh, the critique that uh, Cajetan gives. Uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, yeah. So Cajetan says um, about SCOTUS uh, that the super added ordination is superfluous. Because he would say that the the grace itself would flow from the ordination of God to eternal life, so therefore an act of primo uh, would have an ordering uh, to the reward. So they they would basically take what Scotus held was kind of two things, and they would just smash it into one, and distinguish the type of order in which they were they were held to. Which you know the, the if you want to if you want to kill us over like the distinction between these two, go ahead. 
Um, and then the, uh, and, oh yeah. And then I, I love this footnote, by the way. The variations of the Church of Rome are endless, yet unity is one of their choice benefits, hung out to induce aliens to join her company. Like, okay, bro. <laughs> Whatever you say. Okay, so the um, the fourth opinion, um, there, there may be, possibly, maybe, in a small chance, a few uh, Dominicans who went in this. I think maybe Gonet and Bill Art, from the ring off the top of my head, um, maybe went in this direction. So the, the fourth one is, uh, and this this is actually explicitly against the, Saint, uh, the, the text of St. Thomas, which is why the... The, uh, the both the Jesuits and the uh, and, and the Dominicans don't end up going in this direction, which uh, because St. Thomas explicitly says that um, there's a supposition of divine ordination in the giving of grace, uh, which virtually contains glory. So that that's what the that's what the uh, the Dominicans and the Jesuits are going to hold to generally. So, uh, yeah, this third this fourth opinion, which is really the third opinion, is basically that uh, there, there is, uh, with grace, uh, a proportion to reward with no divine acceptation, no divine ordination, no power to him at all. Which uh, I think this may come from a misinterpretation of, uh, of, their, of their works, but uh, it's possible that, that there were some who held it. Uh, and then, oh yeah, the fact that he quotes Cajetan as holding this and he says Vasquez defended this opinion most resolutely. Oh, so I was wrong. Yeah, I was wrong. So he did say Vasquez held the fourth opinion. I thought he said Vasquez held the third opinion. But yeah, Vasquez defends it most resolutely, which is kind of funny because um, I just quoted Vasquez earlier uh, saying that God could justly uh, not reward condign merit. So, okay, 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 whatever you say. Um. And he quotes Cajetan as holding this as well, which I also, I just showed that this is, uh, the only, he doesn't hold that there's no ordination, but that uh, he's against Scotus's superfluous ordination, which I think a lot of this ends up being, they interpret those who are enemies of Scotus as not holding that the ordination at all is a thing, uh, which is, which is just ridiculous. Uh, because actually Cajetan, you know, Cajetan, uh, now that I remember this, I didn't quote this here. I think I quoted it. Um, I think I quoted it. I, I might just pause this and then uh, pick up the pick up the quote from Cajetan real quick. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I found them. Okay. So uh, basically, this is um, in his commentary on question one fourteen, article three. Uh, for he gives an he gives a good analogy. He gives a good analogy. He says during his analogy that basically um, by one in the same act man is given grace and ordered towards glory. So like if the analogy he gives is that if you were to adopt a child, by the very adoption of that child, they would be ordered towards receiving an inheritance. You wouldn't in the one act need to adopt the child by grace. And then in the, in the other act need to uh, take that uh, grace that they've received and say, okay, well, that's worthy of the inheritance. By one in the same act, you give them uh, grace and uh, by de facto, um, they're ordered towards their inheritance. So that that's what he means when he denies a superfluous uh, adoption. I and this this really is. Uh, let, let me see. Let me see. Uh, here's another one. In the giving of the reward owed to human merit, God can only be considered a debtor to the extent that the act is presumed to be ordained by God Himself. They say, "Oh, there's no ordination, guys." <laughs> like, okay, ordained by God Himself to attain the re that reward. Thus, God becomes indebted to himself, and by giving to us the reward, he satisfies his own ordination. No, no, no ordination, bro. <laughs> Therefore, just as the master of the house, who will give wages to the laborers in the vineyard, first hires them through a covenant or promise made by himself regarding his wages, it is for this reason that the author asserts that the impossibility of human merit extends uh, exists except through divine preordination from which meritorious actions has the aspect of looking to God as the debtor. Divine ordination. Oh, no. Uh, Davenin says there's no divine ordination for catch. No, there's, he says there's no pact, which is funny because this, uh, this uh, first he hires them through a covenant or promise made by himself. This covenant is pactum. 
So there's no pact. And then Kajin says explicitly there is a pact. Uh, it's all so tiresome, isn't it? Anyways, uh, that's about all that I have to say about this. Uh, after In this next chapter, he's going to be uh, setting out the Protestant um, description of this, which uh, should be pretty quick. Uh, so as